tonight. We ask for your blessing as always, Lord, on this uh, interesting chapter. We ask, Lord, that you teach us through your word, help us not to add or subtract from it. And um, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us through this week so far. We expect nothing less than your blessing, Lord, and we claim that blessing upon each of us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Let me get my drink of water here. Okay, so we are on Daniel chapter. I'm sorry? Put on the other one? Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yes, so give me a second here for. Uh, yes, I remember. <clears throat> okay, so this is tomorrow's. Okay. Yep, here, let me have this oh, sticker here. Poster. There you go. Okay. Vernon, do you want me, to, do you have your thing here? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I, I got to make sure I'm all hooked up here. Okay, so now it's on, Vernon? Yeah. Okay, so let's do this. Okay, all good? Okay, <clears throat> so we are on Daniel chapter 8. This is lesson number 13. We'll give you number 14. No, no, um, no uh, raffle tonight, but we'll have the raffle on Friday. And how many of you read chapter 8 of Daniel? Good. What stood out? Just personally, I'm not looking for a right or wrong answer. Just for you personally, what is it that stood out in your mind regarding that chapter? It's about Jesus, okay. Okay. Okay, it just clicked. Good. I'm glad to hear that because there's things that click for me when I read a passage and, and, uh, and I'm still learning. I'm still learning. Anybody else? What just jumped out at you in Daniel chapter 8? Anything? The sanctuary. <laughs> the sanctuary. Okay. Sanctuary. Yep. Sanctuary being cleansed. Okay. Does everybody have tonight's lesson? You do. Okay. Okay, so I have some extra information that I'll be sharing with you tonight that is not in your lesson. And I'll let you know, because last night, some of you were like, Where, where's he reading from? Because I was reading all these other things. And so I should have told you this is not in the lesson. So I'll tell you when things are not in the lesson. Okay. Just a quick, uh, well, let's, let's do an overview of Daniel chapter, uh, the sequence of events in these two chapters, okay? So Daniel chapter 2, you have these kingdoms, <clears throat> uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the, the uh, nations that just are not clinging to each other. There's no world uh, empire after Rome. And when I say world, we're talking about the Mediterranean world, obviously. Uh, the Bible has nothing to do with the Americas or, or China or Australia, obviously. So that's Daniel chapter 2, Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, and Europe. And then in Daniel 7, you have the same thing, you, but except it's, um, it's uh, symbolized in these animals. These uh, animals, uh, you know, prey, vicious animals that hunt and kill which are apt representations of the nations that uh, captivated and evicted the Jews out of their country, out of their homeland, out of their motherland. Um, well, starting with Babylon, obviously, because Medo-Persia, they allowed the Jews to go back. And, um, and then, so beginning with Babylon, basically you have a whole, what they call the Jewish diaspora. The Jews just, they just spread out all over the place. So by the time you come to the New Testament and on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says there's Jews from all over the place and they all speak their own dialects. 
So they, they're mixed, they're mixed. So that's Daniel 2 and 7. And then of course you have the little horn, a horn that begins little, but that grows up to have very, very much power and influence, okay? So today's lesson, that was just a quick uh, review, is on Daniel's longest time prophecy. Now, Daniel chapter eight also uses animals, as you know, you read that there, it uses animals. Um, the ram and the horn. Oh, the ram, yeah, the ram and the, the not the horn, the goat, the ram and the goat, and of course, there's horns coming into play again with these animals. And again, these animals depict historical nations during the time of Daniel. And so Daniel 8, the, here's the interesting thing too about Daniel 8, it reverts back to Hebrew. For Daniel chapters 2 through 7 were all in Aramaic, starting with Daniel 2 verse 4, I believe, was all in Aramaic. And now you come to Daniel chapter 8, and you have some very different things going on in Daniel 8 as far as symbolism and language. So it goes back to Hebrew. Daniel chapter 8 and on forward to the end of the book. Now we, have, we no longer have God predicting the future for pagan individuals, for non-Jewish individuals, like Belshazzar, the writing of the wall, or King Nebuchadnezzar and the statue and, you know, and his dream of Daniel chapter four. You don't have God communicating anymore through the prophet to these world leaders anymore. That's all gone. So that is a strong hint as to why Daniel eight reverts back to Hebrew instead of Aramaic. The other thing in Daniel chapter 8 is that it's no longer using animals of prey, if you've noticed. There's no lions, there's no leopards, nothing like that. Now you have fairly docile animals. You have a ram and a goat. These are domesticated animals and very, very, very significantly, these animals are animals that are connected with the sanctuary service. You can sacrifice. These are clean animals. A lion and a bear, these are unclean animals, according to Leviticus chapter 11. Now you're talking about clean animals and animals that are used in the sanctuary service. And so now this is, pers this is information that Daniel is receiving from God. And somebody said the, the sanctuary, it's interesting how you have sanctuary language, or at least a motif in Daniel chapter 8. But you, of course, also have these nations um, battling each other. And it's curious, why then is Daniel 8 for, the, for um, Medo-Persia, how come there's no bear? How come it uses a ram? And as far as Greece is concerned, in, Rome, in, in Daniel 8, it uses a goat. Whereas in Daniel 7, just the previous chapter, it used a leopard. So why the switch? to from unclean, rapacious animals to clean sanctuary animals. Why the switch? And why the switch from the language back to Hebrew? It's very interesting. So you have, you have these, and then of course until the end of the chapter, it's all Hebrew. Okay, so um, here's a panorama of, of, of empires we're gonna look at. Your lesson says, in order to understand Daniel's prophecies, I'm reading the second paragraph. It is necessary to employ correct principles of interpretation. One of these is the principle of repetition and expansion. This prophetic guideline suggests that each of the great outline prophecies in the book of Daniel continually goes over the same history, repeating the empires of the past, but each succeeding prophecy adds further details on the end time. Daniel 8 and 9 go through the same sequence as Daniel 2 and 7, portraying those empires stated there. The focal point in Daniel 7 was the development of the little horn, whereas the focal point in Daniel 8 and 9 is how God will bring an end to the little horn power. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, now God is, and sometimes you think, why is it going over the same thing? Just repetitive, <laughs> just repetitive. Um, because God is expanding more detail as Daniel gets older and older, okay? 
The interesting thing here too is between Daniel 8 and 9, you have about 12 years difference. And so Daniel chapter 8, uh, we'll see the vision. Daniel has his vision and part of that vision he doesn't understand. Um, and then in Daniel 9, he has to wait for 12 years before the angel gives him the interpretation of that part of the vision he didn't understand 12 years earlier. <laughs> yeah, that's patience. <laughs> Thinking, God, why did you <laughs> wait so long? Anyway, so let's look. Um, you read the chapter. Let's look at these questions. When did Daniel have the vision of Daniel chapter 8? According to the first two verses, the Bible says in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. The other thing I didn't mention earlier is the book of Daniel, the way it's organized, we have the first half, there's a lot of stories, the narratives, those dramatic portrayals of faith and confidence in God and rebellion and beast-like behavior against God by the, you know, by the pagan nations. You have those stories there. And then the second half, you have the prophecies. But the other interesting thing about Daniel is that it is structured according to themes, not according to chronology. When we write a book on history, we are very concerned about chronology. This A, B comes after A, C comes after B. That wasn't, it wasn't like that with the, in the Hebrew mind. They didn't really care about chronology as much as we do today. It just wasn't that important. What was more important is themes. So Daniel is not in chronological order. There are chapters that are, up, that are out of sync in the book of Daniel. So for example, you have Daniel 1, 2, 3, 4. And then after 4, you should get 7 and 8 and 7 and 8. And then you revert, I wrote it down here, but you, then you revert back to chapters 5 and 6, and then you go back to 9, 10, 11, and 12. So they're, they're out of sync, because you notice here, in Daniel chapter 5, what did we read about? Do you remember? The writing on the wall? Yes. And what happened on that fateful night to King Belshazzar? He lost his kingdom and he lost his life. That's in Daniel 5, the end of Daniel chapter 5. But look what it says here in Daniel chapter 8, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. Hello, that's chapter 8. Right. What happened in Daniel 5? <laughs> well, did he come back to life? And so, so don't, don't get confused with that. If you're reading close, that may confuse you. Okay, so um, just, just that's, that's a note. In the third year of King Belshazzar. Number two says, what kind of animal did Daniel see in vision that conquered in every direction. What did he see? He saw the ram, a ram which had two horns. Uh, years ago when I was at the Glendale Church, we went to go visit a couple and they had a ram in their backyard. Oh, I want to go pet it. And I actually saddled it and I held its horns like this. <laughs> and they took a picture of me. Still have that picture. They laugh about that. <laughs> so this ram had two horns, okay. And who does this ram represent? What did the Bible, and it actually says in verse 20. Mm-hmm. The kings of Media and Persia. This is what the angel is telling Gabriel. I mean, the angel is telling uh, Daniel. So this is the interpretation. There's no need to try and guess what the ram means. And it's interesting, you know, two horns, that's a pretty cool symbol. Medes and the Persians, this dual kingdom. Of course, the Persians were the dominant ones. Okay, and then what about the goat? Here's the Medo-Persian Empire. There's a map right there of how extensive uh, it, uh, it went. What is the next animal, animal Daniel sees in the vision according to verse 5? What does he see? Yep. And he goat came from the west. The goat had a notable horn between his eyes. So let me go back to that map. So this is the Medes and the Persians, okay? Media and Persia was, what, where am I? Over here, where am I? This is, my, yeah, Medes and the Persians, the Persian Empire is over here, modern day Iran is over here someplace. And it says that a goat came from the west. Well, which way is west on the map? It's to your left. And if you go up here, here's the Aegean Sea Mediterranean, and here's Cyprus, or is that Cyprus? 
This is Malta is around here someplace. This is Macedonia. And King Alexander was a Macedonian leader of the Greeks. And from this aspect, this is West. So it says here, a an he goat came from the West and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Now, the question asks, who does the rough goat represent and what does the great horn symbolize? The Bible says it. Alexander. It actually says it. The goat is Greece. So the ram was Medes and the Persians, the goat was Greece. The very next kingdom to come into power. There's no need to guess here. The Bible itself is aiming for us. And then, of course, it says that the horn was the first king. The first king who happened to be um, Alexander the Great, one of the greatest generals ever. Um, I should say one of the greatest young generals. Well, he was one of the greatest generals, but he was a very young guy. I'm sorry? Didn't he make it to king? Yeah, he was king. Yeah. yeah. General, but well, general king. As far as fighting. Yes, general king. You're correct. Um, he was a general and a king. And he was just, he was a ferocious. Yeah, yeah, and he was he died at a very young age at three three twenty three BC. He died in Babylon. He couldn't stop, he just kept lying. Yeah, and you know, he was some say he was homosexual and you know that was a popular thing back in those days and um and just dissipation, lack of self control, intemperance and drinking and and you know, that type of thing. But uh, I wish my son was here because my son can tell you all about Alexander the Great. Yeah. My son is almost an expert on ancient history. He yeah. loves this stuff. Years ago, I bought the three-volume set, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire of Edward Gibbons, written in the 1800s. It is a classic. Each volume is about that thick. When he was, I think, in the ninth grade, he read all three volumes. Wow. And I have these scholarly books in my office on ancient Rome and Greece, and he'll, he'll read those. And the other day he saw my book called The Histories by Herodotus. Herodotus was born in 480 BC. He's known as the father of history. And my son came over and he says, oh, <laughs> so I want to read that. Boy, you talk to him, he can tell you all kinds of stuff about, about ancient history. It's really cool. Okay, what did the he-goat do to the ram, according to Daniel 8, verses 6 and 7. What did he do? Well, he conquered the ram. Okay, he conquered the ram. And what happened to the great horn when it was strong? The great horn of the goat when it was strong. What happened to it? It says the great horn was broken after this war and after the goat conquered the, the ram. That big horn just broke off, okay? It broke off. And then in its place came up four notable ones. Now, it's interesting, the Bible uses the word notable. Prominent, important, you know, these are just, I need four ordinary horns, there's four notable ones. And then, of course, the question, listen to this question. What is the meaning of the four horns that come up? What's the meaning of those four horns? Well, horns means kings or kingdoms. We've already learned this in the book of Daniel. The four horns are four kingdoms. And if you look at the note underneath question number eight, Alexander conquered the world. He died at the age of 32 suddenly. The Grecian Empire, instead of being taken over by one person, was divided into four separate kingdoms, Egypt, Thrace, Macedonia, and Syria. And those kingdoms were, were ruled by the four generals of Alexander, Ptolemy, Lys Lysimachus, Cassander, and Seleucus. He had no heir, he had no... No, no heir, no, no kid to take the throne, which is, which is really interesting because all you have to go, all you have to do is go to Britannica.com, Britannica Encyclopedia. Look at the encyclopedias. They'll all say that the, when Alexander fell, the kingdom, his old kingdom, was divided among his four generals. So this isn't a religious, churchy statement. This is actually actual secular history. And the Bible predicted that that's the way it was going to be with the symbolism of these horns. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. We can, we can trust God. If he can predict these things, you know what? I actually found this picture on the internet. That's a cool one. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, that's wow. That's weird. Yeah. So. <laughs> yes. You know, like population-wise? Uh, uh, you know, well, you saw, did you see the map earlier? Yes. Um, yeah, but, it, but that's only like in... In, in area, in territory. territory. But you're talking about population. population yeah. I don't know. Uh, we're talking about millions of people. Yeah, I'm, I'm same, sure, millions, millions of people. Yeah, and millions of people that are multicultural. They're, they, they're, you know, there's different cultures and different <laughs> religious practices, but I don't, I have no idea what the population was. That's a good question though. Question number nine, what does Daniel see coming out of the four winds of heaven? Let's open your Bible to Daniel 8 and verse 9 because I want you to notice something here that is uh, important. So go to Daniel 8 and verse 9 and that's on page 866. And uh, I want you to Put your eyes on verse 8, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 8, and then we'll read verse 9, page 866. Okay, it says here, therefore, verse 8, the male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. So in verse 8, you have four horns, four notable horns, and they came up toward the four winds of heaven. So you have two sets of four, four horns and the four winds of heaven, okay? Four winds of heaven is another way of saying north, south, east, and west, okay? Then in verse 9, it says, and out of one of them came a little horn. Now, question I have for you. Where it says, out of one of them, what is the antecedent for the word them? Is it four horns or is it four winds? I changed my slide so you won't see. So, and this is an important question. Where it says, and out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. The glorious land is another word for the, uh, Israel, Palestine. And so either out of, the, out of one of these horns grew a little horn, or out of one of the four winds came the little horn. horn. Which one is it? My Bible says a small horn out of the small horn whose power grew very great, it extended toward the south and the east and toward the glorious land of Israel. And verse 9? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so read verse 9 again, the beginning. It says, then from one of the prominent horns... Okay, it, okay, stop there. Horn. See, interesting. So that version says, out of one of the horns. That one, that one says, out of one of the horns. Does any of your Bible say... One of prominent horns. Does any of your Bible say, out of one of the winds? So this is very important. Uh, it may sound too technical, but it is important. And the reason being is, if this little horn is the same little horn of Daniel chapter 7, which is the horn that speaks pompous and blasphemous words against the Most High, the little horn that persecutes the saints of the Most High, the little horn that thinks to change times and laws, that little horn of Daniel 7, is this the same little horn? No. Well, here's the thing. Let me go back here and... Uh, Can I read the next verse? No, hold on a minute. I want to go back to this map. Okay. This is, the, this is the Grecian kingdom. This is the kingdom of Greece. Okay? What we read was when Greece fell, there was no other world empire that came immediately after it. Rome did come after, but that was afterwards. In other words, Greece was not, the king Alexander the Great was not succeeded by another great king country just split into four parts until Rome came, eventually came along. So this little horn, if this little horn 
came up from one of those four horns, as Diana's Bible says, then that means that the little horn came up from the Greek kingdom. And you still have Rome coming into play afterwards. So if this little horn came from the four divisions of the Greek kingdom after Alexander the Great fell, then that little horn must of necessity have Greek origin. And then after that little horn did its thing, and then Rome came up to power afterwards. The other option is, if the little horn came from one of the four compasses, of four, one of the four winds, which is you know either west, north, east, or south, then that little horn, it's not giving its origin here, it's not giving its origin of territory or kingdom, it's just saying it came from some place on the compass is what it is. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it came from the Greek, the divided Greek kingdom. You see the difference here? There's a huge difference. Because some will say that the little horn of Daniel chapter uh, 8 verses, uh, let's go back over here. So we're not talking about the big horn, okay? The four horns that come up, let's go back. Okay, so what does Daniel see coming out of one of the four winds of heaven? You notice on the screen, if you look on the screen, I put four winds. And the reason for that is that the best, um, there's, there's Hebrew words going on here. Some of them are masculine and some of them are feminine. One of them is plural and one of them is singular. The best antecedent for the word them is not the four conspicuous horns or four notable horns. It's the four winds, which is why we have it on here. Even on the bottom of this, where it gives you the little... Read it for it, us. It says the meaning of the Hebrew for these verses is uncertain. Yeah. Um, I, should, I should have brought, um, you know, a copy of the Hebrew. It's technical scholarly stuff but it compares the Hebrew wording and the best match, and you'll just have to take my word for it until I bring it to you, but the best match is not horns, it's winds. Now, this little horn is engaged in certain activities. Um, oh, the other thing I wanted to say is, if it's the little horn that came from one of those, the, the divided Greek empire from one of the four generals, then that little horn could very well be one of the Seleucid kings, whose name was Antiochus Epiphanes, the fourth. Mm -hmm. It could very well be Antiochus Epiphanes, the fourth. Why? Because of the interpretation that that little horn came from one of the four notable horns. So that would make sense. It would make sense. It's Antiochus. But if it came from one of the four winds of heaven, then we as Seventh-day Adventists say, no, it didn't come from Greek. That notable little horn, that little horn is the little horn power of Rome, of pagan Rome, that eventually metamorphosed into religious Rome. And so you have two different time periods. You have one coming from the Greek divided empire before Rome. The other interpretation is no, the little horn came from Rome. So that's much later. It makes a big difference the way you interpret that, uh, verse uh, 9. Okay, so there was a little horn. Number 10, who does this little horn stand up against? Who does this little horn stand up against? Stands up against the, God's people. Yep, and, and against God himself. The Bible says, he shall also stand up against the prince of princes. The prince of princes is a reference to Jesus Christ. So the power here described as a little horn stands up in opposition to Christ himself. And of course, the power that crucified Christ was pagan Rome, um, which was the next empire, empire in the sequence of empires foretold in the book of Daniel. So this little horn stands up against the prince of princes, Christ himself. Okay, here in these verses, look up on the screen for a bit. Here in these verses, Daniel 8, verses 8 through 12, reveal pagan Rome evolving into religious Rome, all the way through verse 12. Um, and you can read those on your own. 
Does this little horn stay a little horn according to verse 10? Look at verse 10. You have your Bible open. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. In other words, it waxed great. It grew up. It waxed great in the King James Version of the Bible. It waxed very, very great. So it didn't stay small. It was very boastful, even thinking that it could challenge heaven itself, this little horn power. Okay? And as the little horn became great or waxed great, what five things did it do? So notice in verses 11 and 12, here are the five things that it did. Number 12, letters A through here, E, and I have it up on the screen. He magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Okay? He magnified himself that big. Now, here's the interesting thing. In, um, in Isaiah chapter 14, you have a bean that says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. Who said that? Lucifer. It was Lucifer that yeah. said that in Isaiah 14. So this little horn is trying to usurp heaven itself and exalt itself above God. The very same characteristics that Lucifer himself manifested when he was still in heaven, when he, when he still resided in heaven. Okay, letter B. By him, the daily sacrifice was taken away. The daily sacrifice, that is in verse 11. Now, how many of you look at your Bibles? I have the Bible in the, the pew. Um, how many of you see that word, the daily sacrifices, in your Bible? Raise your hand. Sacrifices? Okay, good. I do too. Is the word sacrifices italicized? Okay, so I am looking. Um, I am looking here. Um, I should have. I should have seen this before in the preface. But usually, when a word is italicized in the Bible, why would I, they italicize? We italicize words because we want to place emphasis on that word, right? Don't you ever do that again. If you're writing something, you put the word ever in italics, or you underline it, or you bold it, right? Well, why does the Bible italicize some words? That's exactly right. It's the translator's way of telling you, and, it's, and it's, uh, if you look for, at least in this Bible, or any Bible that you have, if that word is italicized, read your preface to the Bible because it has important information in the prefaces. Sometimes I read prefaces to Bibles, and it gives you great information. Go to the preface of the Bible, and you may find it that the translators have supplied this word in the Bible. In other words, they added it themselves. That's why it's italicized. Now, I italicized it here on the screen. By him, the daily sacrifice was taken away. The reason being is because that word in the original Hebrew is not there. Now, this is something else very important. It may sound just technicalities, but it is important. Because the popular view is that this little horn came out of the four notable horns of Greece, the, the divided Greek empire, the four generals. Therefore, it must be Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth, because it came from the Greek divided empire. And Antiochus just so happened in about 167 or 165 BC, around the one, mid 160s BC, he actually sacrificed a pig in the temple in Jerusalem in the second century BC. He took the sacrifices away and sacrificed the pig, which is, you can imagine for the Jews, they were just, you know, they were just besides yeah. themselves to see this happen. Now, if that is the understanding, well then yes, he took away the sacrifice, 
Well, the Bible must be talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, so let's insert the word in there. I kid you not, this word's not in the Hebrew. So the meaning for the daily, there's a word in there, there's a Hebrew word for there, it's called the daily, it has the article. Here it says, by him, the oh, it has the article, okay, by him, the daily. If you take away the sacrifice, how, do, how would you read it? By him the daily was taken away. Now the word chatamid in Hebrew means the daily. And the daily chatamid is a reference to all of the sanctuary service that took place on a daily basis. It did not signify just the sacrifices, although it included the sacrifices. It was when you came and, you know, the priest sacrificed the animal. If I sin, I, I slit the throat and the priest would drain the blood and then, you know, cook it on the altar. And then the washing of the hands that the priest would have to do, you know, the utensils and the laver. And then you go into the holy place and you have to trim the wicks of the candelabra. And then, of course, every Sabbath, they would replace the 12 loaves of bread on the table of showbread with fresh, 12 fresh loaves. And then, of course, daily you had to burn incense on the altar of incense. This is all the holy place. So the chatami, the daily, includes all of that stuff. Not just the sacrifices. It's all of that stuff. And so if we are true to the original language, well, yeah, but did Antiochus take away everything from the Jews? There's a lot more about Antiochus as the reasons why he cannot refer to this, he does not fulfill all the prophecy. Diana? Okay, well I just wanted to, I, when I said the question right before the sacrifices, I was reading the wrong part. Uh -huh. But just to clarify exactly what you said, it says in, my, in the New Living Version, so the daily sacrifices were halted and truth was overthrown. The horn succeeded in everything it did. Right. By stopping. Yeah, so Antiochus did do some pretty bad things. But, well, it's, it's in the lesson. He, did, he never grew great exceedingly. This is the problem. This is the problem with this. And, uh, this little horn grew ex waxed exceedingly great. That's not a good description of Antiochus. In fact, um, if you talk about this little horn having power for time, times, and half a time, he doesn't fulfill the time prophecy. He doesn't, the time aspect. He doesn't fulfill the waxing is exceedingly great at all. And he did not destroy the sanctuary and bring it down to the ground. He didn't do that. So there's reasons why Antiochus is not uh, uh, fulfilling this. So anyways, just keep that in mind. The word sacrifice has been supplied. The place of his sanctuary was cast down. This is what I was saying. Antiochus never cast down the sanctuary of the Jews. Letter D. It cast down the truth to the ground. Well, in a sense, if you're sacrificing a pig, you know. <laughs> um, but I think, I personally think casting truth to the ground encompasses more than just replacing, you know, sacrificing a pig. And then letter E, D, it practiced and prospered. That's not an apt description of Antiochus. Okay, so this is what the little horn is doing. And then look at your note on the top of page four. We are not dealing with just the pagan Roman Empire. In the later days of the Roman Empire, the little horn changed form. It became a religious political power that cast down the truth of God to the ground, practiced and prospered, and destroyed the truth of God's sanctuary because it cast it down. In following the sequence of Daniel 7, the next power after pagan Rome is papal Rome, religious Rome. Daniel 8 uses the same symbol to represent both powers, indicating the connection between pagan Rome and papal Rome. Again, this isn't just a Seventh-day Adventist invention. Um, history books, secular history books will tell you that pagan Rome metamorphosed into religious Rome. Um, some of the terminologies, the structures, uh, in fact, we saw this in Final Empire. Uh, Sean Boonshaw talked a little bit about this. Um, Daniel 13, uh, number 13, question 13. As Daniel contemplates all that he has seen in this vision, what question is asked? According to verse 13, as he contemplates, what question is asked? 
How long shall be the vision? How long shall be this vision? And how long would it take for the sanctuary to be cleansed? That's question number 14. And the Bible says 2,300 days. That's how long it would take for the sanctuary to be cleansed. 2,300 days. So this is the vision that Daniel is getting. Now, on your note below question 14, it says 2,300 literal days is a little less than seven years. It is not a very long time for all the events described in Daniel 8 to take place. According to Daniel 8, the 2,300 days would encompass the Medo-Persian, Grecian, Roman, and Papal powers. So uh, according to that year-day principle, um, we're talking about 2,300 years. In fact, um, people, futurists or dispensationalists, futurists, I was just looking at a video on my way here from a, a futurist dispensationalist. Um, they use the day for year, the, the day for year or year for day um, formula. They use it. That's how they come up with the tribulation. You ever hear about the 70 weeks of Daniel? The 70th week, the Messiah, the Messiah shall be cut off in the middle of the week. Well, what, what dispensationalists do is they take that 70th week and they put it far into the future. Far into the future. But Daniel chapter 9, and I'm jumping ahead, but Daniel 9 is talking about the 70 week prophecy. How many days is 70 weeks? 490 days. 70 weeks is 490 days, just over, over a year. What's that, about a year and a half maybe, or something like that, close to a year and a half, 490 days? Well, those who believe in the seven-year thing, in the middle, the seven-year tribulation, ever hear of the seven-year tribulation? Why don't they say a seven-day tribulation? We're talking about Daniel's 70th week. So why don't they say the seven-day tribulation, which is the last week, the 70th week? You never, ever hear them say that. They'll say seven years, not seven days. They're using the year-for-day principle. All of them do. Tim LaHaye, Jenkins, the Left Behind series, they all use the year-for-day principle. That's the only way they can come up with the literal seven-year of course, they de detach it from Daniel 69 weeks, which I don't think it, there's, it's a legitimate thing to do. But anyway, so we're talking about 2,300 years, not days. Number 15, does the Bible support the use of a day for a year in prophecy? I have appointed the each day for a year. So we talked about this. Number 16, what is Daniel told about the vision of the evening and the morning? In Daniel 8, 26. What did you write? Shut thou up the vision. Yep, so the angel, the, the angel is telling the vision, shut up. <laughs> okay, shut thou up the vision. All other aspects of this vision were clearly interpreted for Daniel. Okay, Daniel 8. What part of Daniel 8 was interpreted for him? We went over this. I'm sorry? No, in, in Daniel chapter 8, what things have been interpreted for us? 2,300 days. Before that. No, Daniel 8, the 2,300 days is not interpreted. Yeah. What's interpreted? Yeah. 4 or 7 is what is interpreted. No, there's, there's something in Daniel 8 that Daniel is looking at this vision and the angel interprets him for him. What? No, Daniel chapter 8. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, understanding? No. The ram and the goat. Yeah. Yeah. Those things were interpreted for Daniel already, right? So Daniel has no reason to think, what, what does the ram mean? What does that goat and what does that big horn mean? No. Daniel may not have known Alexander the Great, but he knew that big prominent horn from the goat was the first king. He knew the goat was Greece. He knew the ram was the Medes and the Persians. And Daniel was living in this time. At, at this time, no, this was the third year of Belshazzar, right? Third year of Belshazzar. So he knew pretty soon the Medes and the Persians are going to conquer Babylon. And he's looking at Babylon. 
how in the world are they going to do that? This city is impregnable. <laughs> and then he knew, and after the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks are going to come. Daniel knew this. So he didn't lay sick for days and he was confused and fainty because he already knew that part. The part he didn't know was the 2300 days or years. And the angel says, too bad, I'm sorry. Shut up the vision. I'm not going to share any more information about that. And the Bible says that Daniel was just, uh, just besides himself, he was, he was not feeling good. Why didn't God give Daniel an interpretation of the 2300 days at this time? This is number 17. And the Bible says, I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for certain days. Now, I have sort of a different view on this. Um, I didn't write these lessons, but um, I, I don't think God stopped the vision there because Daniel was feeling faint. I think when Daniel especially saw about the sanctuary and the little horn bringing it down and bringing truth to the ground and all this stuff, I think that's what got Daniel sick to his stomach. And then that's who was, and you know, and God just said, that's, that's enough for now. That's enough. You, you have enough information. You're not going to be even alive, you know, when the goat comes, Greece. You're not going to be alive. So that's enough for now. But uh, the Bible says he was sick. Uh, so he understood the first part of the vision, those animals. But the only part of the vision that was not explained was the 2300 year part. Question 18. What is Daniel doing when chapter 9 opens? He's praying. He is praying his heart out. He's praying to God. Do you know why he's praying? He wanted, the, he knew that the time for them to go back was soon. That's right. That's right. So he was reading the book of Jeremiah, a scroll, or he had his own copy. And he understood from the book of Jeremiah, this is in Daniel 9, verses, uh, verse 2 and 3. He understood that the time was near for the end of the Babylonian captivity. He understood that. So he starts praying his heart out. God, I kind of feel like down deep inside he was thinking to himself, don't change your mind, don't change your mind. Because <laughs> he yeah. begins to confess his sins. He's confessing the sins of the people back in Jerusalem. And he's pleading for mercy. And he's saying, God, remember who you are. You're a merciful God. <laughs> you promised that please don't change your mind. And he's just praying his heart out. That's how Daniel 9 opens. Number 19. Who appeared to Daniel in answer to his prayer? Gabriel. Gabriel. And I love this verse. Look at Daniel 9, verses 20 and 21. Look at verse 21. This is page 868. The Bible says, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forward to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, when he first said, Dear Lord, <laughs> at the beginning, the command went out and I have come to tell you for you are greatly beloved. So, Wow, this is, this is cool stuff. So Gabriel comes to him. Now, I said earlier in the evening, how many years had passed between the end of chapter 8 and the beginning wow. of chapter 9? 12 years. 12 years. And Daniel, maybe he's thinking, oh, holy smokes, I totally forgot about that. That was 12 years ago, Gabriel. <laughs> 12 years ago. It's about time. <laughs> Thank you for bringing me. Um, so during those 12 years, no prophecies were given to Daniel. He just went about his political business. You know, it's amazing when I'm reading this, and I don't know if, 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 if God would reveal something like that to me, I'd probably be sick. Yeah, no I know. I mean, and we're talking men being a, a man of faith. And right. I mean, your faith is there. It's right. Like, it's just kind of hard to, to take. I know. It is hard to take. I was having a conversation, I don't remember with who, a few days ago, and I said, oh man, I'm, or maybe I said it here, I'm glad I'm not a prophet. I yeah, never yeah. want to be a prophet. 
because uh, because prophets uh, they I mean they're privileged to have this information and God chooses them for a reason because of their characters and their faithfulness. But yes, that's that's a good way to put it, Diana. The weight that they carry and some of the stuff they see, I would not want to see. I wouldn't want to see it. It'd make me a risk. Oh yes. Oh. Oh. Oh, the responsibility. Oh, the accountability, responsibility. It's, it's out of this world, so um, I'm glad I'm just a nobody. <laughs> For now, you never, oh boy. But, and Daniel, being the guy that he was, he was fainted. He fainted and he was sick for certain days. My goodness. Okay, so question number 20. What is the purpose of Gabriel's visit this time, 12 years later? Yes, and there it is on the screen. I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. Understanding, understand the matter and consider the vision. Now, here's another interesting thing. Some technical stuff, but important so you can un appreciate what's going on here. For a synonymous word for vision in our English language would maybe be uh, a trance or a dream or something, something like that. But our Bibles just translate vision as vision. In the Hebrew, you have two words for this English word vision. You have two words in Hebrew that's present in Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. Those two Hebrew words are chason, can you say that? Chason and mare. Those two words mean vision. Now here's a cool thing, and I wish I could have illustrated with the chart. I'll have to do that the next time. I told you I'm rewriting the lessons. I'm going to add all of this cool stuff uh, to these new lessons. Um, the part of the vision in Daniel 8, the 2300 days part that he didn't quite get, and I, I may be getting these mixed up, but for the sake of this conversation, so I may get the words mixed up. Let's say it was a mare. The 2300 part of the entire vision was a mare portion. Whereas the vision itself, the whole vision itself was chason, but it uses another word to describe the part of the 2300 days, mare. Again, they may be inverse. It's interesting. In Daniel 9, when Gabriel comes, he says, in this word vision, he says, now consider the matter, I have come, understand the matter and consider the mare. He doesn't say chason. He says mare, which is the 2300 part in Daniel 8. It's very interesting. It's totally absent. We can't get that in the English. So it's kind of like me, you know, telling Vernon, I give Vernon uh, a letter. And on the top of the letter, it says, my letter to Vernon. <laughs> and so he has the letter. But I tell Vernon, Vernon, um, I'm going to come over and cut your lawn. So this portion of the letter, cutting, I'll just say that, this portion of the letter, cutting, cutting the lawn, cutting, I'll do uh, in a couple of weeks. So he gets the letter. And then, uh, oh no, I may just say, and, and uh, I'll do the cutting um, in the near future. So he writes me back. And he says, um, so I got your letter, I understood the letter, but when are you going to do the cutting? Now, if somebody just reads his letter, the cutting, those, what is it referring to? And then I respond, I'll do the cutting in seven days. Okay? So the cutting part of his lawn, it's all part of the letter. But there's a specific part of the letter that I wrote to him that he didn't understand. It was the cutting part of the lawn. So I respond to him, I'll do the cutting. It's exactly what's happening here. The chason is the whole vision, but the part of the 2300 days is the mare. And the angel comes back and says, now I came to give you understanding of the mare. So you have some a linguist, a linguistic connection between the two that we know that Daniel 9, 
Gabriel comes to interpret the 2300 days in Daniel 9. The angel Gabriel just interprets it in a different way than you would expect. He doesn't say the 2300 days, blah, 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 blah. It's kind of different. Okay, so there has been no new vision since the vision of the 2300 days. Okay, that's that 12 year period. Number two, the 2300 days, this is not in your lesson, okay? This is just on the screen. The 2300 days was the only thing not explained in chapter 8 because the rest of the prophecy was explained. The ram and the goat and the, the big horn and the little horn. He said, uh, but the little horn will tra cause truth and sanctuary to be cast down in 2300 days, etc. Number three. The same angel that, that appeared in, in chapter 8 appears again in chapter 9 through 12, I mean, chapter 9, 12 years later. Okay? Oh, I put that wrong place. Daniel, yeah, so there's 12 years in between Daniel 8 and 9. Daniel is now told to understand the prophecy. The only vision to be understood was the vision of the 2300 days. Therefore, Daniel 9:24 and onward would be the logical place to find the interpretation of the 2300 days. Why do I say Daniel 9.24? What about verses 1 through 23? What's going on between verses 1 through 23 and Daniel 9? Remember how Daniel 9 starts out? Praying. Praying. Verses 1 through 23, Daniel is pouring out his heart. By the way, here's a spiritual lesson. Um, and I'm doing it here because of time. The bulk of chapter 9 is a prayer. Yes. <laughs> the bulk of chapter 9 is a prayer of submission, humility, confession, repentance. That's the bulk of chapter 9. I propose that we need to spend more time reading that prayer instead of jumping right to verse 24 to the end of the chapter where it talks about the prophecy. Because the reason why Daniel received this privileged information in the first place was his prayer life. <laughs> was his prayer life. So we can't just skip it over. The 70 weeks were are coming down here, 21. How much time of the 2300 days was determined or cut off for the Jewish people? You know what? I may have to, um, I may have to stop here. Why don't we continue this on Friday? Okay, because look here, I got some really cool charts and everything. And oh, yeah. Yeah, it's really cool, so it'll help you visualize everything. Why don't we stop here, and then we'll continue on, uh, on Friday um, with this, because this is, it's, it's a lot of information, and I don't want to just speed over it. So, I'll still give you the lesson for, well, no, Friday I'll give you those. Actually, I'll give you this lesson, the next lesson, so lesson 14 will be for, now I just came out of sync. I was organizing my lessons, so I'm out of sync now. But I'll give you this. So this is going to be for Saturday morning. Okay? And then Friday, unless you want to see Friday, uh, on Friday, when we continue this, I can give you the two lessons for Sabbath morning and Sabbath afternoon. Or I can give you this one for Sabbath morning, and then Friday I'll give you Sabbath afternoons. <laughs> Is that confusing? No, that, that sounds like a better deal. Which one? The latter? You want to have this? Okay, Bob, would you do me the honors? Test those out for me. And then uh, this Friday, I'll give you the lesson. That way you can look at this and be prepared for Sabbath morning. Thank you. So that Epiphanes guy, uh, it sounds like he was like a spoiled kid or because he was trying to do all this stuff, but it came to a point where Rome told him, you know, you cross this line. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I, I kind of had a hunch that you were going there. Yeah, so Antiochus, he was, um, he was wanting to do all these great things. And you're absolutely right. I don't remember the Roman general's name, but he, he drew a line in the sand. Around him. So or around him. him. Or, 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 yeah, and he oh. says, you cross this line, we are going to bring the Roman army against you. 
And so what did Antiochus do? Well, gee, maybe I was a little bit ambitious. <laughs> and so, okay, so he does this. <laughs> he was not in going to incur the wrath of Rome. So, but that's exactly what happened. He did do horrible things to the Jews. The one I just read, I mean, just, ugh. How could a person do that? Yeah. The other thing, interesting thing about um, Daniel 8 is uh, not only are the, the word sacrifice um, inserted, but um, because of that, the 2300 days is split into 1150 by those who understand the, uh, understand the daily sacrifices. So what I mean by that is this. Um, if, if 2,300 days, if you divide that by, uh, by 360, so let's do some math here. 2,300 divided by 360 equals 6.38 years. 6.38 years. I say 360 because in the Bible, a year is 360. Each month is 30 days. So it's 360. So if you divide 2,300 days by 360 days, you come up with 6.388888888888. 6.38, which is, means years. Okay, so here's the problem. Well, the 2,300 days... Um, Antiochus didn't rule for 6.38 years. He didn't, he didn't reign for that long. Oh, wait a minute. But the Bible says he took away the daily sacrifice. Remember, sacrifices is inserted. He took away the daily sacrifice. Ah, oh, how many sacrifices were done per day by the Jews? What's the answer? Well, there was two. two. There was two. There was a morning. Two yeah, there was the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. Oh, wait a minute. So if you took the, away the daily sacrifices and there's two sacrifices per day, well, then you have to divide 2,300 in half. So you get 1,150 now, right? So this is the reasoning. So 1,150 now divided by 360 equals 3.19. Now that's almost three and a half years. And we haven't gone over that portion yet because it says the, uh, the little horn is a three and a half year rule, time times and half a time, which we understand to be 42 months or 1,260 days or years. But they say, oh, that's what it is. So Antiochus, now that more fits, 3.194 years. But that's not even quite three and a half years. 3.19 is not 3.5, a half. So even then, Antiochus, if you're being strictly three and a half years, Antiochus didn't even rule for three and a half years. But the interesting thing is, dispensationalists divide that 2300 and they divide it in half because of that word sacrifice, the daily sacrifice. Nowhere does Daniel give a hint that that's allowable to divide it in half. And that word sacrifice is supplied. It's talking about the whole sanctuary service, not just a sacrifice. The trimming of the wicks and everything, it applies to the whole thing. Now, there's, there's a lot of symbolism because um, in Daniel's day, in Daniel's day, there was no, um, there was no, a temple that they were having the regular services. There wasn't. Remember Nebuchadnezzar, he's the one that took all of their gold vessels out of the sanctuary. The candelabra, the table of showbread, and you know, the gold vessels and the cups, and he took everything. You think he's gonna take the plates and the bowls and then leave that beautiful golden table behind? He took all of that stuff. And uh, they weren't having, this is, this is during Daniel's time. It was not until the Persians that they allowed it to come back. Anyways, I'm going farther off. But we're going to stop here. Number 21.
on Friday evening. Any questions or comments? It sounded like the Jews actually kind of defeated him. Uh, Antiochus? Yeah, when they he put out a death penalty again for anybody that did any circumcising, and they so they went with him. That yeah. Yeah, so he wasn't, he wasn't the all-powerful king that the little horn seems to portray this power and growing great towards the glorious land. That just was not Antiochus. But I'll, um, I'll try and get some information where I can give you more about Antiochus because it's, it's very popular in Christendom. Whereas we interpret that as pagan slash religious Rome. The little horn. So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this information. Um, Lord, it's a lot for us to absorb and much less remember. But um, it's important information for us because it reminds us, Lord, that you know the future and you are in control and that Daniel, as well as us, are on the winning side, even though there's tribulations to go through. So we thank you, Lord, for your word and this amazing prophecy. Bless us tonight, Lord, with a safe trip home, back to our families, and a good night's rest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, have a good night, everyone. We'll see you Friday, okay. 7 o'clock.